My name's Harry. I'm one of the guys who makes Periscope. And uh, Periscope is the tool that Zuhair mentioned way back at the beginning of the talk. Is, uh, he uses to do some of the more complex analyses that he runs. And uh, in particular, I think he showed which a, graph, a set of graphs that I hope you can see that are relatively sophisticated where uh, you know, they can look and they can say, wow, this experiment line, which is the red line, is actually trending you know, consistently better than the control line, which is the blue line, over daily active users. And that's great. Even more importantly, it's not lower on all of the per DAU metrics. So you know, this is, looks like just a straight win. And uh, because we're able to visualize this, we can see, wow, we really want to launch this experiment, uh, which I hope is the can we be WhatsApp experiment, because that would be really great for KeepSafe. Um, in addition to doing visualizations like this, though, Periscope does something which might be more important, which is it runs the analyses much faster. So instead of doing the same queries in 10 to 40 something minutes, Periscope does the queries in 3 to 16 seconds. And when you can do the queries, we see a lot of variance from customer to customer. At KeepSafe, we see about 150x improvement. When you can do the queries 150x faster, you can actually sit at the terminal and keep typing and run the next analysis and the next analysis and the next analysis and run 150x more analyses than you might otherwise do. As a result of which, your whole company becomes more data driven and your product becomes a lot better, users get better products, and so because people are working at Periscope on making analyses faster, the world is a better place. <laughs> We're really proud of ourselves. And so you might think on like your first day at Periscope, wow, we're going to be working on really hard problems. We're going to be working on this really hard, important problem of making it really fast. And that's true, and anyone in the audience who remembers Periscope's pitch from 18 months ago might remember that we talked a lot about how to make it fast and how exactly it's going to be fast and all that great stuff. But I'm not going to talk about that much right now, uh, except to say that it involves uh, buying a lot of memory. Um, this is a box, this is a photo I took like an hour ago at our office. Um, so we run this data cache. The data cache returns queries a lot faster than customer databases do. Uh, and so you know, people are working on it. You bring up the cache. Customers are querying it. Life is really good. Uh, get more customers, hire more people. Life is even better. And then one day you wake up, and you have some 10 terabytes of data under management. And you discover that you have a new problem. And that new problem is the actual title of my talk. And the new problem is cache coherence. So you have 10 terabytes of data under management. And one day you get an email that says, Dear Periscope team, your tool is really awesome. I run these queries really fast. My whole company is more data driven. My users are having better lives. Except sometimes it seems like the data is wrong. And that's like really not great when it's like your revenue data and you're sharing it with your investors, or it's your gameplays data and you're sharing it with your developers. Um, it's really you make your own customer look bad with bad data. So we can't do that. So, uh, what we need to do is find a way to get the customer's data in their database to be the same as our data in our database at all times. All right, cool. First idea. This is a solved problem, right? Databases replicate to other databases all the time. Uh, I can bring up a new Postgres database tomorrow. It will have the same data as my current data Postgres database. It will stay up to date. So Periscope will do the same thing. We're going to install an agent on your database server. It's going to consume the database replication log. We will send all that back to our servers, uh, execute the same queries, stay in sync forever, have a beer and go home. Except, turns out, even if every single customer trusted us enough to install a, a binary on their database server, and every customer was willing to do this work of installing this binary and coordinating with us to make sure that the binary was phoning home correctly, uh, before ever getting to use the product, most of the customers could not do this. You see a lot of Redshift databases, see a lot of Amplitude databases, uh, we see a lot of Heroku databases. None of those folks can upload a binary onto their servers, so we're back to square one. But it's okay, right? Because what we can do, we have this user account on this database, so all we need is a query that will tell us what are the rows that have changed since the last time we ran this query. What query should we use? Screw it. We're a startup, right? We're going to have like minimum viable cash populator. We're just going to download all the data and we're going to move it all over the wire. And sometimes we'll move it from like Oregon to Virginia, but that's okay. It's not that far. And we'll upload it into the cache. And once every five minutes, 10 minutes, hour, maybe once every day, we'll just replace all the data. It'll be fine. 
Uh, this works particularly well. It does work still in production on small tables. And I'm pleased to say that it works less than 5% of the time. Turns out when you hit like 10 million, 20 million, 30 million rows, uh, this cost of the database scanning every single table, sending you the entire result set, we move the entire result set over to our servers and upload it, the customer can actually add more rows faster than we can get the rows, and you end up falling more behind over time, which let me tell you is not very much fun. Um, but something that you learn when you're trying this is we get plugged into a lot of data warehouses. And it's really common with data warehouses to just have one big denormalized append-only table. Or maybe if you have like revenue and events and users, maybe that's like three big append-only tables. So you know, every time the user does something, we'll just write a database row and we'll never touch it again. You know? And then if we're using Periscope, which makes things really fast, we'll do like our group and count distinct and it'll come back pretty quickly and we can do all our metrics. So instead, we're gonna just do this. We're just gonna write down the last ID that we saw in every table, the last primary key, and every time we touch that table again, we'll ask for just the new rows. Turns out this works pretty well, and 64% of the tables that we see are append only, and so like maybe 64% of the problem is solved and we're making good progress, except many databases we see, one in five of the append only tables literally have no primary key at all. And so there's no way to ask the database, at least not from a user account, which are the new rows. The database doesn't know. But you know, we're a startup and we think, okay, well, maybe this isn't perfect and maybe it's not perfectly scalable, but this event that they're writing in this you know, denormalized table, it has some like time, right? There's like an event time or there's a created at or something like that. And uh, that's probably good enough. We can just sort the table by that, write that value down and you know, do something like this. We'll get sort of, sort of clever with our heuristics to pick which date time column to use, but it'll be okay. This works all right as well. Unfortunately, now we're sort of narrowing in on the pathological case of no reliable date times, maybe because you're writing insane dates from mobile apps that do crazy things. Uh, maybe you just didn't design your tables very well. But now we have the no ID tables. We have no date times. Maybe they are append only. Maybe we don't even know if they're append only anymore. So if you do out the math through the whole talk, you'll discover that we have 26% of tables in our cache that we call hard mode. These are really big, sometimes billion row tables, and they're, you know, any row might be updated, any row might, you know, new rows are being appended, and there's no way for us to know what's going on. So it turns out one really interesting thing you can do is you can hash the rows. So I said it was about, you know, maybe at about 10 million, we can ask the database to give us that number of rows and get it back fast enough over and over again to keep updating the data and keep it fresh. So we pick a million as n, we say we're gonna be safe, and for every million row range in every table in this set, we say, dear database, give us the hash of this row, and we're gonna run, or the hash of this row range, and we're gonna run that query simultaneously on your database and on our cache, and we're gonna say, if these hashes are different, throw the data away from our cache, get the new data from the database, plop it right in there. This works really well, and this is what we're doing in production. one real annoyance, which I don't know if you guys can read that, but we support some six or eight odd database types and we run one database type in our cache and it's important that the hashes be the same on the customer side and on our side. So now we need a query that runs on Google BigQuery, on MySQL, on Postgres, on SQL Server uh, and all of these other databases and is the same and gives you the same hash back. So we choose, oh man, you can't read this at all. Um, well, we choose MD5 because it is um, fast and it is supported everywhere. We don't have to run it on Android phones, thank God. Um, and uh, we actually say, okay, there's four types of columns that we're gonna support. There's integers and booleans and date times and strings. Everything gets set to a text. Everything gets md 5 If there's no value in the column, the MD5 is a space. And at that point you have, and we concatenate all of that, and we hash it again. And at that point you have one MD5 per row, which is pretty good. Um, and at that point, you have what we consider to be like our standard representation of data in a table. There's some corner cases like if the string was a space to begin with, or if the string, like a null can get replaced with a space or something like that. But in practice, we don't see that very much. Um, and then we do all this stuff, sort of all this work up here in the select, basically to take a million times n MD5 hashes and turn it into like four integers because that's really fast to move over the wire. We can ask your database to do more of the hashing work, move a really small amount of data over the wire and compare it on our side. Um, so we actually end up taking that MD5, 
breaking it into uh, 32 character chunks and then taking those as integers, summing them and sending them back. 